Uh, now we're going to move into a part of the program that I know many of you were looking forward to. and such a, It's so fitting that when you think about the things that Henry really tried to emphasize here, his focus on genetics, his focus on always making cattle better. And we've made tremendous progress with the advent of population genetics. Uh, the things that really occurred, we talked about the first sire summary that John Crouch and many of his colleagues uh, put out in, the, in that uh, 1980. The progress we've made is immense. But in, in all seriousness, I think the progress that we'll have the potential to make in the cattle industry, this great industry that we all love being a part of, is going to get even more exciting as you go to the future. As I look around here, I see a lot of young people, look at the Gardner family and their grandchildren wanting to be involved in this business. This business has got an exciting future, folks. And to talk about that, we're going to get into the genomic side. It's going to get a little heavy duty, but it's going to get exciting as well. And really to kind of set the stage, uh, we're going to have a couple folks that do just an excellent job in the industry of not only knowledge knowledgeable in terms of understanding how this works, but their ability to communicate that. And we're going to start with Dr. Sally Northcutt. Actually, Sally was involved in the video. Um, Sally, they said you're a rock star. Really, I'm going to introduce you as one heck of a geneticist. She is one smart lady in terms of understanding genetics, does a wonderful job as, as a director of genetic research at the American Angus Association. Sally, uh, we're going to turn the next part of the program over to you. She's going to walk through a little bit of the evolution of how we've gotten to where we're at, and then we're going to really get in deeper into the genomic side. So Sally, great to have you part of the program tonight. Thank you, Dr. Cora. It's a privilege to be here. What I'd like to do is to set the stage for a lot of our discussion tonight and questions and share with you some of the background of so many of the selection tools that you've already heard about thus far. Uh, when you think about the American Angus Association database, it really functions as the currency uh, that we work with and the various records. And uh, the data has become the currency for what we do today, and you'll see that theme throughout. If we just walk through uh, some of the history on this, the uh, John Crouch left some legacy in his office for me, and this is a, a an original sketch out by Dr. Richard Wilhelm of what the National Sire Evaluation information should look like on an individual animal on the left side. And then to your right, you will see that actually put into implementation with estimated breeding values that were first released. So the evolution of performance program is, is steeped with tradition. We look back in the 70s and the National Sire Evaluation Program beginning and then releases of those reports. That's Dr. Wilhelm on the right who put together a lot of the, the, the concepts and the methodology of what we use today in terms of being essentially the father of uh, EPDs. In terms of selection tools, uh, what I've summarized here is, is a lot of the, the pieces that run throughout the Gardner Angus history. And when you think back of average daily gain uh, collected at a bull test and sorting out sire differences and carrying that further into the initial within herd ratios to better characterize genetics and sort out differences. And then we really in the 80s had the big push with expected progeny differences or the EPDs that you know. First for the growth traits and then expanding that into additional traits such as those characterizing the end product. From that point, we wanted to take a piece, the uh, selection indexes that had been used by other livestock industries and try to put a, a dollar sign with those selection tools. And now this next step that we'll talk about tonight and discuss is putting the genomic piece in that. You know, if you know the genetic map of an animal, how can we refine and better characterize seamlessly into the tools 
that we already have with those EPDs. And this carries on further into the dollar values which utilize those genomic enhanced EPDs as well. I really noticed in this whole chain of information how uh, it, it sped up quite rapidly just in the last couple of years. What a database. Uh, we've touched on this already. Uh, so much, but when you look at the amass of just uh, records that are reported just in one fiscal year at the American Angus Association, we pull from this resource over time and, and the millions of pedigrees and the millions of measures that help us better characterize what the cattle will do. So we're essentially turning the data into uh, selection tools that you can utilize. And I think this is a foundation uh, for the program where, where we are today. This is just an example of the detail and the metrics that allow us to make genetic progress or genetic change. And now we've been able to enhance those EPDs through some, some pretty stiff math, but uh, to better characterize the accuracy on young animals, non-parent bulls, and then carry that through to the dollar values. The big picture of what we're doing here, if you think of the pieces that go into the EPDs that you study quite diligently uh, on the Gardner cattle, for example, you may have an individual record on an animal, uh, all the extensive pedigree that we keep at the association, and granted, the, the younger bulls, they're not going to have progeny yet, but you can have varying sources of information that classically tie in to the expected progeny differences. Well, what do you do with the genomics? Well, ideally, we want to put all this together seamlessly into one set of selection tools. And the Beef Improvement Federation, or BIF, have made recent recommendations that let's try to tie these DNA results into the common language that we use right now to, to, to select bulls. And so let's tie it into the EPDs and then let's report this in the form of a BIF accuracy. So at the American Angus Association, in working with uh, genomics companies, um, Igenity and Pfizer, then we've been able to work through this methodology to seamlessly provide you genomic enhanced EPDs. Right now, it's a one-stop shopping in a sense, and that you're able to work, uh, work through our website uh, at the American Angus Association and through, AB, um, through AGI to um, order genomic test results and have that uh, piece of information tied into your EPDs and actually affecting all the genetic evaluations that we do. I just want to share with you the pieces as an example of how we calculate, in a sense, a genomic enhanced EPD. And it's sometimes fun to work with a, an example we're familiar with, uh, such as the carcass traits. And so we already have carcass harvest data, so, you know, marbling scores, for example, on, say, 90,000 records. And so that's our economically relevant set of traits, carcass weight, marbling, uh, ribeye, and fat. And so we also have ultrasound data on millions of animals, and we tie that in as an indicator trait. So think about you might have a marbling score on a set of steers, but you also have um, ultrasound IMF on bulls or heifers or steers, and you use that as an indicator. And we've added an additional piece out to your right side there where we can incorporate the genomic results uh, that are provided to us from the genomic companies as results from the tests that you order and pull this all together into the EPD. So you have all those contributing indicators, say the ultrasound IMF and the genomic results from profiles and 50K uh, reports from Igenity and Pfizer. So that just kind of outlines how we pull that together mathematically. And one of the things we had to do was to get that onto a weekly basis so you would have rapid feedback of how your genomic results are figure into your EPDs on a weekly basis as opposed to you, you waiting each six months to see how your EPDs have changed. 
And so just to kind of, this is the backup slide for Sally. What is taking so long if you're waiting on a particular genomic result to be in our EPDs? What's taking so long? Well, just in a snapshot, first thing that we do when we establish these uh, genomic enhanced EPDs is we want to calculate the genetic relationship between that genomic test and the data that we already have on hand, the phenotypic database that so many of you all have contributed to or studied or been a part of over time. So first we have to establish that genetic relationship between the genomic result and the trait of interest. So then we have to do the math and get it into the EPD calculations. And with supercomputers, we can run those quite readily to provide those on a weekly basis. So I mostly work with doing the math piece. And then we're able to release the genomic enhanced EPDs. So many of you all are familiar with, with some of the background of what's already available. And the next release that we're planning will be uh, next week in our weekly evaluation. We will be including the Pfizer uh, genomic piece into the growth EPDs. So that would be impacting the birth and the weaning and the yearling and the milk EPDs. So that's the latest and greatest in terms of what our planning is for next week to put the Pfizer 50K into the growth EPDs. And then later on this month, we have not released a genomic calving ease enhanced EPD yet. And so our plans are to put both companies into the calving ease EPDs. So, so that's pretty much hot off the press, but those are our plans upcoming. Finally, as I bring my comments to a close, it's always um, a good reminder that you have these selection tools that tie together varying sources of EPDs and economically relevant pieces to put them in a dollar value fashion. And at any point when we have genomic enhanced EPDs, that figures into the EPDs that go into the indexes. So I guess they're essentially genomic enhanced dollar values as well. And the same would apply with our dollar beef value, which you're looking at not only that post-weaning genetic merit, but also that quality grade and red meat yield component to put together a nice package with the dollar beef. Again, genomically enhanced by what you already have by the contributions in the carcass EPDs. What's in the future? I think we all have some additional challenges. We're, we're getting pretty good at incorporating uh, the classic traits and the genomic pieces all into one nice package. Uh, in the future, I think you'll see additional genomic enhanced releases. I, I've shared with you the, the latest and greatest ones upcoming. But we'll continue to have a precision and refinement of the genomic panels. And then we have some additional challenges in working with some of the difficult traits of the reproductive complex. I don't think we do a meeting where someone doesn't say, yeah, do you have some of those tools that we can access on the reproductive complex to assist in what we do in our cow families and our breeding program? We also are interested in expanding what we know about cattle biological efficiency. Right now we have a residual average daily gain component, that new EPD, and that's more geared towards the, the feedlot and post weaning gain piece. I think we need additional expansion of this efficiency component into the cow herd as well. And then herd health out on the horizon too. So.